program directors, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, mine is very easy. I'm going to introduce someone that is very much within a short period of time become a great friend of the Dr. Richard Mabonya Institute, University of Johannesburg, and all the role players in this project. I also want to acknowledge the leader of the coaching center, uh, Peddy. I know she couldn't be here. Uh, I know Dr. Tumizanima Adela was supposed to be here, and also another colleague from Cape Town office. Remind me the name. Anyway, um, why I'm mentioning it is because we got introduced to Adriano at the time when it became an imperative that this year's lecture ought to be addressed by somebody that had something to do with the Brazilian magic, as Dr. Mabonya calls it. And uh, we were glad to get to be introduced to Adriano. And I also want to acknowledge his colleagues that are here. Mr. Adriano Campolina, I know Lawrence Slavan is here. When I spoke to him on radio, he said, that sounds like really a concoction of something magical. <laughs> so I'm glad Lawrence is here. And by the way, uh, we acknowledge you, Lawrence, and thank you for that opportunity to introduce Adriano to your Power FM perspectives long before even we introduce him here. He is today, so you can talk to him uh, afterwards. Mr. Adriano Campolina has been working in the civil society, leading human rights-based development programs and campaigns for the past 22 years. He is an agronomist with masters on agriculture, development, and society. He has been a political activist since high school, leading the students' associations at both his high school and college. He was part of the Liberation Theology-inspired Catholic Youth Movement, I assume. It stays here pastoral. Um, he was Youth Secretary of the Workers' Party in Minas Gerais State. I don't think I pronounced it well. But I want to ask him that uh, I think the Workers' Party, he will tell you maybe about it, but that is what the party that was led by President Lula that actually came back with the Senai model that inspired Dr. Richard Mabonya. As a youth leader, Adriano had a strong participation in the Brazilian mobilization towards democracy, new constitution, public education, and agrarian reform in the 80s and early 90s. Mr. Campolina started his professional career as a dairy farmer. Those of you who are in farming. He worked with local NGOs at Countryside Brazil, where he was born, implementing local development programs in many of his communities. He was also part of a national network on sustainable agriculture with strong emphasis on development and conservation of agrobiodiversity, including participating on global negotiations on diversity, biodiversity and farmers' rights led by the United Nations Body FAO. Adriano worked as advisor for the National Confederation of Workers in Agriculture, CONTEC, where he was deeply involved in developing rural workers smallholder farmers and landless movements propositions for land reform, smallholder farmers credit schemes, and other agrarian policies. He was also advisor to CUT, which is the National Central Organization for Labor Unions, providing political and economic advice. Adriano worked as chief of cabinet for the Workers' Party congressman Valde Genza and took part in the party working group on agrarian issues, supporting the development of party positions in a range of agricultural and agrarian themes. 
Adriano focused his early career on policy issues related to food security and gradually took over management and leadership position, focusing on contribution to the internationalization of Action Aid through the evolution of power to countries. In Action Aid, he has led campaigns, programs, and policies in Brazil, and then of course Action Aid's international trade campaign and the Americas region. He has also been the executive director of Action Aid Brazil, where he pioneered international fundraising from emerging countries in combination with strong local programs. Adriano Cambolino is the chief executive of Action Aid International and he has been in this position since 2004. He has restructured the organization to further devolve power to its members and also led a coalition building with other NGOs and networks to fight together against inequality. And I know, talking to Adriano, that one of the strategic moves he had made, he has made was to relocate the head office of Action Aid International from London to Johannesburg. And he said to me that it, it didn't make sense to have a body like this located in London when most of its beneficiaries are in developing countries. So we have Action Aid South Africa based at downtown Johannesburg, Bramford to be specific and the Action Aid International Global Office, headquartered in Rosebank. And we are honored as a country to have such powerful organization and great leader based in our country. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Mabonya, Professor Van Leel, George Negota, honorable guests, I present to you the second UJ Dr. Richard Mabonya annual lecture on entrepreneurship guest speaker, Mr. Adriano Campolina. Dr. Mabonya, Professor uh, Sam, thanks a lot for such, uh, such kind words. Uh, it is a really, really great uh, honor to be here tonight. I really uh, would like to say a big thank you to the University of Johannesburg and to the Maponi Institute for organizing that. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, opportunity. Uh, I feel so welcome in this country. I'm, I'm living here for just one and a half years. Uh, and it's such a privilege uh, to be able to meet such fantastic leaders, uh, fantastic colleagues, that comes uh, with us on those uh, dialogues, and also an opportunity to really share and to learn together uh, about many, many issues that uh, we, will be, we, we, we have been uh, dealing with. Uh, let me just give you a note of caution. I'm Brazilian, so that's a very funny accent. Uh, so I will try to speak slow, so you get used to my accent uh, as the lecture goes. Uh, but I also said I'm very glad that we are talking about entrepreneurship and not about football because we are still traumatized by the 7-1. So let's not, let's not get into that one. So let's keep, let's keep on entrepreneurship, not football tonight. Uh, I had a horrible experience on, on, on the World Cup. On the night Brazil was defeated, I was flying to Germany. So uh, can you imagine something colder than a German uh, immigration officer. There's nothing can be more cold than that. The guy looked at my passport, looked at me, did not smile, complete silence, said, Sir, do you want me to stamp seven times? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, after that experience, I, I came back to Joburg and I have my friends on Action Aid that were welcoming me and not making any jokes for three minutes. And then uh, it has been like that since then. So, on that note, uh, let me uh, start by, by really uh, once again saying a big thank you to Dr. Maponia. Uh, it's very inspiring uh, when we start talking, I went to Dr. Maponia home and we talk about this lecture, uh, to see a business leader that has such 
a big vision uh, and uh, look ahead. I think that that's not every day. Uh, and uh, I remember we sat uh, at, at, at his home and we mentioned about inequality, and which, was, which is an, a discussion that's quite a recent discussion uh, on the development world, if you want. Uh, lots of people have been talking about inequality on economics, uh, but it became a quite big issue for good reason that I'll, take, uh, I'll talk about that later. And Dr. Marconi immediately said, look, this is one of the most fundamental issues that we face in South Africa and in the world. And there is no way to build democracy and to fight poverty and to build a just society if we don't address that. And hearing that from a leader that has built such an important uh, a presence on the South African economy uh, is something that inspired me deeply. And I want to say thank you very much for inspiring us uh, with that uh, long perspective and deep perspective. Conversation because you, you, you may be curious what an international NGO development fighting poverty uh, uh, leader is doing here talking about entrepreneurship. Uh, and I think Dr. Maponia is the one that noticed that first that there is no way to build an inclusive economy if we don't actually uh, bring the enabling factors of fighting poverty and fighting inequality together with the support to entrepreneurship. Uh, and those two come together. We cannot separate both. Uh, and we do need to build an inclusive economy. Because the way the economy is going nowadays uh, will be just impossible for each one of us either to succeed as entrepreneurs uh, or to have a better quality of life if you are excluded and poor, uh, or for countries to really build up societies uh, that bring democracy to its real uh, significance. So I believe that's a quite fundamental part of it. And uh, having so many entrepreneurs together here, I think, creates for us a great opportunity uh, to really have a conversation on how do we locate entrepreneurship into a bigger agenda of uh, inclusiveness, uh, with, of democracy, of uh, social and economic democracy. So we don't look at that in isolation uh, from the environment in which uh, your, your businesses, uh, your initiatives uh, actually operate. As Dr. Marconi has, has done, uh, generating so many jobs and creating uh, a kind of, uh, of, uh, of business under the most difficult circumstances ever uh, that uh, I, I heard from, from, from on him and some as well uh, we've been discussing that. So I think that's a, a great opportunity, so thank you for that. Thank you for coming uh, and, and, and sharing that night with us. Uh, let me just say a little bit what's ActionAid, uh, so you see why, what I'm doing here. So ActionAid is an international non-governmental organization uh, working to fight poverty for uh, almost 40 years now. Uh, and it started as a British organization that uh, had this view of, uh, which was very common in the 70s, early 70s, of let's fight poverty by transferring resources. So we have lots of resources here in the north, so let's transfer some of those resources to the south and everything will be fine. Uh, obviously, it did not work, because that's not only about resources. It's about also the capacity to organize, to build capacities, uh, and to build skills so people can build a different future. So we learned that lesson over our time, and we moved from a charity perspective into what we call a rights-based perspective, in which we work with people to, number one, empower people, uh, including economic empowerment. So we have a lot of entrepreneurship activities uh, with local communities, and I'll give you some examples in a minute. Uh, we also think that's very important, the sense of solidarity, because no one alone can find solutions uh, to the complex problems that we face in the world. So we therefore have a lot of work on solidarity and bringing people together to share their experiences and to work together uh, to fight uh, for a different world. Uh, to build up the future with alternatives at community level, as well as to scale up those local alternatives into public policies that can make sure that most of the uh, population can have access to that. 
Uh, and in doing that, we also have campaigns in which we engage with governments and authorities to say, look, those alternatives can actually help us to change, uh, or those impediments can be removed uh, by change of policy. So that's what we do, uh, and we do that in 45 countries. Uh, we work in, in uh, thousands of the most impoverished communities across the world, uh, implementing that approach uh, in collaboration with people uh, in those countries that we work, including in South Africa, where we have very strong work uh, as well. And what we have learned in this process, and that's the connection as well with entrepreneurship, is that when you connect those dots, when you connect the empowerment of the communities with the ability to work with others uh, and with the ability to change the policy framework around them, you actually uh, make profound change on how the society is organized. Let me give you three examples. Uh, I will start with one that is uh, the favorite of my friend here, Ben. Uh, he went there in Brazil. He was uh, passionate about uh, the Quebradeiras de Coco Babassu. Don't worry, I'll explain what is that. Uh, Babassu is a nut. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, it's the fruit of, of a palm tree. Uh, so Babassu tree uh, produced that nut. And uh, for hundreds of years, uh, people in a very impoverished condition in the northeast Brazil, the state of Maranhão, they live from collecting that nut and breaking that nut to sell in the markets uh, for very, very low uh, value. Those, those trees, they are not in their farms. They are on the farms of the landlords. So Brazil has landlords, like big landlords. We're talking about 10,000 hectares, 20,000 hectares. Uh, and those communities, and particularly the women of those communities, they depend to access to those trees to get the livelihood out of that, of those uh, nuts. So what we have done with them? We worked with them for many, many years, for more than 20 years uh, of work. They have a very strong organization uh, of uh, Babassu, uh, they, they call themselves Babassu Nuts Breakers. So we worked with them very strongly, and they have moved, first of all, they want to have access to the land. So we managed to pass bills uh, in more than 100 municipalities granting them full access to that. So they have to walk in the big farms to have access to the trees. So that was the first victory. Second, we organized with them how can they really scale up their skills and their capacities. So instead of producing the very low value uh, produce of that, of that tree, they could add value and work in a cooperative. So they could organize themselves in solidarity. And thirdly, how by doing that, they could access to other markets. So I can tell you now that those communities, they are exporting to at least three big companies in the US. Uh, they, they, they produce, and they are making so much more money out of it that they have created an opportunity for them to come to a next level in terms of the quality of life. But more importantly, to their to, to the children as well, because together with uh, increasing the value of their production, they have also increased the access and, and and have consolidated the access to land. So that has been a quite transformational change in which change on the, on the structural cause of poverty, such as access to land, together with local entrepreneurship and people's alternatives, we could change uh, the life of, of, of that people. Uh, I was in Uganda uh, last week and uh, visiting our program, and uh, I had this opportunity to talk with another group, which was very inspiring as well. It's a group of women that is uh, they are victims of violence. So they are victims of domestic violence. So we have a, a, a guest house in which we receive those women. Uh, and uh, we work with them through legal uh, action to also uh, psycho psychosocial uh, support. And those women now, they are organizing themselves to produce bags uh, and they sell the bags to sustain the movements, but more importantly, to create to themselves a source of income, so they are not forced to go back into an environment of violence. So again, entrepreneurship uh, and rights coming together to produce uh, sustained change. So that was another uh, important story that I saw recently. And the final one, Mozambique, uh, I also went there. That last week was a, was a busy week. We had a, a number of meetings uh, in, in the region. So I went to Mozambique as well. Uh, and in this community, in Manisa, uh, what we saw, I went to a colleague of mine that's here, uh, Sakani, uh, and what we have seen there in, 
in, in Manisa was a community where the organization and the fact that those poor farmers came together as a cooperative allowed them to have access to support from the state to investment, but more importantly allowed them to really increase their ability to produce uh, vegetables and to have micro-irrigation uh, schemes to the point that they are selling. They are not only feeding their families much better, but they are selling that in the market and they are accessing other goods. So again, entrepreneurship sometimes uh, looks like something uh, very difficult and very far away, uh, but it is something that poor people are doing every day. And if we are able to support them on that, uh, on that trajectory, uh, we are very sure that they can uh, move uh, quite a lot. So that's a bit of what we do. And let me talk about Brazil, because I know Dr. Maponha uh, was, was keen to have someone from Brazil here, not because of the football game, uh, but definitely because of the uh, opportunities that we had when fighting poverty. So my involvement with that uh, experience was a, a very funny one, because it was a mix of uh, being involved as some, uh, one of the people that were organizing farmers to demand from the government change on the, on, on, on the, on the, on the policies. Uh, as a farmer myself then, when I was uh, on the dairy farming uh, work, uh, and as an advisor for, for a political party. And it was interesting to see, because sometimes people think that uh, the right environment to fight poverty comes from the head of one leader. Uh, and Lula was, and is indeed, a fantastic leader. Uh, but uh, what makes him fantastic, because he, he knows it doesn't come only from his head. He knows that it comes from uh, a much more collective process. And his great ability as a leader was the ability to listen. Uh, and to listen and to understand how other people could come together. And to listen to those that no one listens, who are the good people. Uh, and, and, and their movements. So you may have heard about the Hunger Zero program. Uh, so Hunger Zero is a program that uh, uh, President Lula, uh, very, in, in a very uh, synthetic and smart way, uh, just said, look, I have only one promise as president. Every Brazilian will have three meals. That's my only measure of success. If when I leave office, every Brazilian eat three meals a day, I've done my job. So he just summarized an entire social uh, uh, ideology and, 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 and proposals into one sentence. But that came after 10 years of huge dialogue between the Workers' Party, the Farmers' Associations, the Cooperatives, the Women's Farmers' Associations. We've been discussing 10 years before Lula became president what we had to do and what has worked before at community level that would inspire us uh, on that change. So that dialogue was the dialogue that allowed uh, the change to happen in Brazil. It was not a miraculous leader that arrived, woke up in the morning and said, I have the solution. No, it was someone that had the capability to listen and to learn from the very real experience that people had. So on the Hunger Zero, uh, that has uh, basically generated a program based on four pillars. One, access to food. And for, for that, it was absolutely crucial to have social protection mechanisms. So we had a very strong uh, cash transfer program that started, uh, together with uh, other groups, but we'll come to that in a second. Uh, they also have the issue of who produced the food, uh, and therefore how can we support and, and, and really increase the support for the smallholder farmers uh, that produce most of the food that Brazilians uh, eat. Just a quick parenthesis here to give a dimension of the land inequality in my country. In Brazil, 85% of the farmers are smallholder farmers. However, they only have access to 30% of the land. The 15% remaining farmers have access to 70% of the land. Those 15% does not, they do not produce most of the food that Brazilians eat. That's the smallholder farmers on only 30% of the land. They produce 60% of the food that each one of us Brazilians eat every day. Uh, and they have access to only 25% of the credit. So that gives us a sense of inequality and why inequality is important. Because uh, if the, the large-scale the large farmers 
are the ones that have the financial capacity to fund campaigns and to elect representatives. It's just logic what they will do. They will make sure that the public credit comes back to the large farmers. So changing that was a quite tough process. So what we did within Hunger Zero, the second pillar, uh, was to make sure that would be an exponential uh, increase uh, on the credit to smallholder farmers, as well as an acceleration of the land reform program. Uh, the final, the third one, uh, uh, and final, was about accountability. So how we make sure that on implementing those uh, changes, we have accountability in which the communities can hold the government to account uh, and can make sure that uh, we don't have corruption, but more importantly, we also ensure that the resources will end up on the hands of those uh, that need needs the most. So those changes happened at the Hunger Zero, uh, which was, uh, again, not a creation of one leader, but a collective co-creation of an alternative of policies in which you have a leader, you have entrepreneurs, we had uh, social movement leaders, you have politicians that came together, and academia, uh, that came together to think about uh, what's the sustainable kind of change that we needed. Dr. Maponia mentioned earlier uh, the fundamental results that we had in Brazil. And that's true, Brazil, although now we are going through a difficult uh, economic year, uh, but Brazil did have a quite, a quite crucial change uh, on, the, on the way the country uh, is. More important, what happened on the past, uh, now is from 2003 to now, the past 12 years, uh, was a combination of policies that were quite transformational uh, to the country, both in terms of fighting poverty and creating an enabling environment to entrepreneurship. Uh, just to give you some numbers, uh, on the past decade, the extreme poverty was reduced from 8.3% of the population, that was in 2002, uh, to now 1.1%. Uh, so that was quite a huge decrease uh, on poverty, uh, and that's continuing to fall. Uh, in this period, uh, more than 15 million people moved from extreme poverty, which means people that went hungry every day. Uh, they, they were removed from extreme poverty, uh, and 35 million people have moved from poverty to uh, lower middle class or middle class if you want. Uh, or some would say they just became workers with a decent pay, uh, as opposed to just being uh, middle class. Uh, that were impressive, uh, th those were impressive numbers that changed the face of Brazilian society in many ways. Uh, the, the, the task is far from being completed. Brazil remains one of the most unequal countries, and unfortunately on that world cap, we are, we are fighting a very strong with you. Uh, South Africa, of course, are both very unequal countries, Brazil and South Africa. Uh, we are dealing with some, some challenges, but I think it's important to reflect what happened that allowed us uh, to get from that. And my sense is that what we had in general was a combination of a very active role of, of the state. The state did take its uh, it job on creating the policies that can enable uh, those changes particularly the social policies, uh, job creation and the role of entrepreneurship on job creation was absolutely crucial. And in my opinion, it was more important than uh, the social policies was the jobs. Uh, the creation of jobs and the increase of minimum salary was quite fundamental, uh, as well as the support to, inter to, to inter entrepreneurs, uh, to the entrepreneurs in, ma in many ways, uh, from, social, from capacity building to credit uh, to entrepreneurship. There has been uh, quite a lot of that. So let me just go on some of those. And of course, no country has recipe to any other country. Uh, so what I want to do is just to reflect on some of those areas of work and, and how could we, uh, uh, in many other places, try to, to look at that. The first one was the social policies. So Brazil had uh, a welfare system that is quite complex and it remains quite complex that combines public pension, public education, and public health. Uh, the system has been strengthened, so it's a combination of universal rights, particularly on, edu on education, health uh, is universal. Uh, so every single citizen for, the, for, for being a Brazilian or being in Brazil have full rights uh, to access to those services. Uh, together with some focus uh, activities, 
that were quite transformational. One example, the cisterns. So the northeast part of Brazil is very dry uh, and has acute uh, uh, lack of water. So there has been the construction uh, of uh, 800,000 cisterns that basically is taking, uh, harvesting, harvesting the water from, the, from, from, from rainfall uh, and, and, and storing that in a cistern that has increased the access of those families to land. Again, entrepreneurialism. You know how it started? By two or three small associations of farmers that redesigned the way of building the cisterns in a much more economic way. It became, and then was a 10,000 cisterns objective. It became, during the Lula government, a one million cisterns program. So it moved from 10,000 to one million families that had access to that. Because someone, an entrepreneur, found a way to do that. Uh, and a social movement transformed that local alternative into a national policy to one million people. So that has been a quite important change. Uh, another one is the cash transfer uh, that now benefits 14 million people, uh, for 14 million families, sorry, uh, about, uh, uh, about now uh, 45 million people uh, in the country. Uh, and, that, and also a, a new housing program with 1 million, with 1 million families. So those, those, those various uh, social policies have created a quite important enabling environment that helped the country uh, uh, in, in a very significant way. But the most important for me was job creation. So employment was the fundamental thing. So through uh, those 12 years, 13 years, uh, what we have had is a very strong emphasis on job creation. And there are incentives for that, because uh, you are entrepreneurs. So depends on what kind of incentive you have, you're going to generate more or less jobs. Uh, and that was a fundamental part of the credit policies in Brazil. The government would only give policy credit, uh, would only uh, facilitate access to credit to those that could prove that they are doing their best to actually generate jobs. Uh, and what happened is that 18 million jobs were created between 2002 and 2012. 18 million. Uh, and that was not by the creation of jobs focused only on the big companies. Uh, the folks were actually on the small and medium uh, uh, enterprises. That's where most of the jobs came from. Uh, the creation of a very vibrant uh, small and medium uh, uh, enterprise sector that actually had support from the government in terms of public policies, but more importantly had uh, a lot of support on making available in the market sufficient money for consumption. Because when you have 35 million people that live in poverty and becomes consumers, that creates such a dynamic local development uh, and such a dynamic uh, capacity uh, to absorb that. And those companies were not in Sao Paulo, Rio, or the big cities. They were actually quite widespread uh, across the country. So that, that generation of jobs, 18 million jobs, was absolutely fundamental. Together with a real increase on the minimum, minimum wage uh, of 70, 70, 72 percent uh, from 2003 to 2013. 72% is quite a lot, it's almost doubling. Uh, and that happened uh, as, as real increase uh, already. So those formalized jobs uh, and improved salaries are now seen by most economists in the country as the main reasons why Brazil has been successful uh, and uh, has achieved so much in terms of fighting poverty. The third area was uh, well, your, your area entrepreneurialism uh, and technical and vocational education. There has been a very strong emphasis that any family that was on those programs of uh, poverty eradication, they should also have access to vocational training. They should also become uh, the, crucial, the crucial target group uh, for the training. Uh, and in Brazil, we had basically two big uh, uh, groups of people in poverty. One is the rural poverty. So we're talking about uh, a big number uh, of farmers, that's 3.5 million small-scale farmers, most of them poor. So what the government has done for those ones was the creation of a very strong uh, smallholder farmers credit system, uh, which is only for smallholder farmers. So therefore, they could actually create much, a much better condition to uh, go ahead with their businesses, together with 
a very strong uh, service of extension in technology and innovation for smallholder farmers, and one very creative policy that I really, I, I'm really in love with, uh, which is called uh, uh, the public procurement policy. So we have a huge school meal program in the country. Uh, every single public school has two meals for all students. Uh, and uh, the government just said the following, 30% of the school meal must be procured from poor farmers from around, the, uh, around that city. So they have created a market with quite consistent prices, uh, with uh, predictable prices, and with predictable demand. Uh, and more importantly, changing the dependence on high industrialized food uh, towards a much more diverse diet that would actually uh, be dependent on what those farmers produced. So that has created, together with the systems I said before, a revolution on the Brazilian rural uh, environment. So you have a much more vibrant, locally based economy where entrepreneurs, in this case smallholder farmers, uh, have a clear access to institutional market that can create a sustainability that they, 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 they uh, are not dependent on government subsidies, but they can move uh, towards uh, a much more sustainable way. For the, for the uh, urban pool, what has happened was they created a program called Pronatec, which is uh, a national program of, uh, to access to vocational and technical uh, education. So through that program, uh, they have offered that program for free for the poor people that were on the social programs. Uh, and 8 million people had access to this Pronatec course. Uh, from those 8 million people that have access to vocational training, 60% now have jobs. So uh, that's the kind of good investment that you combine the technical and vocational training uh, and you directly uh, link the social policies and the target of social policies to that. And I'm so happy to hear that the uh, uh, Maponia Institute uh, is looking at the vocational and technical education because that combined with those all areas uh, can really have a, a, a huge impact. Uh, 400,000 people that were beneficiaries of the cash transfers programs uh, have become individual entrepreneurs. 400,000. Almost half a million people that were receiving government subsidies uh, to make sure they would have access to food are now uh, small entrepreneurs uh, by that access to credit in one hand and training uh, in the other hand. That came together with a strong infrastructure that I think we should also mention, and I know Dr. Maponia has, has uh, visited that uh, in Sao Paulo, which is the Senai system. So it's a system uh, of, uh, of uh, educational, uh, uh, for, for technical and vocational education, uh, which is run by the confederations of the industry of the, uh, and, and of other areas of commerce. And that system has uh, a great capacity uh, they have already trained more than 12 million workers uh, and they have uh, 2.3 million enrollments a year for technical and vocational courses. That was created over many years of investment and I believe that's quite crucial that you create an infrastructure of vocational uh, that goes to a, a level of massive education to really train people to the kind of jobs that are, that are uh, uh, available. So those were the principles and strategies. So number one, strong social policies and a good combination of universal rights together with uh, a very strong a very strong focus social programs to really uh, uh, create the, the transfers of, 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 of income that we needed jobs and salary was quite crucial as well and finally the support to entrepreneurialism uh, both in terms of vocational training as well as provision of credit uh, for new entrepreneurs we start uh, the, the new businesses. Well, I'm now living in South Africa and, uh, and I've been very, very happy to be here. Uh, well, in one hand, it's one of the most unequal countries in the world, uh, and that's no difference for a Brazilian. Uh, I think we are still most unequal than you. I hope we, at some point we will change, we, are, we start going down on that inequality, but it takes long. Uh, on the positive side, is a country that's not just happy and quiet about that. So the fact that you have 35 protests a day, uh, and what I saw with the students a few weeks ago, uh, shows that uh, South Africans are not just happy and quiet uh, with the circumstances that you are going through. 
South Africans are committed uh, to change, and I think that brings a, a lot of, uh, of hope. Uh, my sense is one of the fundamental issues that we, on Action Aid, uh, have been dealing with, the issue of inequality, uh, is also crucial uh, in this country. Uh, we believe that the fact that 200 people, 200, the, the 200 wealthiest people in the world, they have, they own as much as the entire African economy. Uh, it's something that has to be addressed. It's not just because uh, we don't like inequality for the sake of not liking inequality. It's because inequality became an impediment to growth. It became an impediment to jobs. Uh, it became an impediment to fighting poverty. Uh, and that's not just uh, uh, people from the development sector or NGOs talking about. That's what IMF is saying, the International Monetary Fund. That's what OECD, uh, the Organization for Economic uh, and Development Cooperation is saying, the group of the rich countries. So it's a crucial thing uh, that we all have uh, to tackle. Uh, and when we look uh, at the, the government of South Africa having recognized that, it's also quite important issue uh, that the government of South Africa has elected inequality as one of the uh, national priorities together with unemployment uh, and poverty. Uh, that we should all focus on. Uh, obviously, for us to deal with inequality, there is no other way unless we look at levels of redistribution and what kind of policy can redistribute uh, the income in a way that you can create a more sustainable society. So access to land is one of them, uh, which I will not go in more detail because I already told a lot about land in Brazil, but access to land for us uh, sounds a very crucial thing. Another one is stopping the illicit, illicit flow of funds. So if you look at the impact panel recommendations uh, and the understanding that $50 billion leave the continent annually as illicit financial flows uh, is something that we also, as uh, a society, have to be clear about that and also look at uh, what kind of tax policy will allow a sustainable uh, generation of revenue for the state. So, uh, those social policies can be delivered uh, and also making sure they are delivered in a way that are responsive to the needs uh, of the poor. Uh, I already mentioned lay, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the issues around land. I would also uh, mention the issue about minimum wage. And I'll tell you a story. When, when Lula was elected in Brazil, when the Workers' Party was elected, the average comment was, you're going to bankrupt the country. How can you say you're going to raise salaries? Uh, and uh, on the first election when Lula was candidate, it was 1989, uh, the president of the industry association said, uh, if he, if he uh, wins, I take the first plane uh, and I'll take all my fortune elsewhere. So what happened? Well, Lula won, uh, and that guy is still there. Uh, and you know why he's still there? Because he has increased his profits on an economy that could distribute income and could generate a much larger base of consumers. So Mr. Amato continues in Brazil uh, in spite of his uh, first panic. So looking at what is the minimum wage uh, that, that can really provide for a family uh, is quite crucial so uh, the, the society as a whole uh, can grow. Uh, the support to inter entrepreneurship and vocational training, uh, as I said, in the case of Brazil was crucial. And I think the same uh, applies to South Africa, it's quite, quite important. Uh, I, together with wage, we have to talk about jobs. And, and, and I think sometimes we have the, the illusion where the jobs come from, what industry that really generates jobs. And then I'm a very strong supporter of uh, the support to small and medium enterprises, uh, as the number of jobs that can be generated by a vibrant a sector of small uh, and medium enterprises, together with other companies and bigger companies. But I think that combination of a vibrant sector in the economy can generate jobs in a quite large scale. Uh, of course, together with government support to that, because it's not just like that, you have to have support. Uh, in the case of Brazil, the economic growth was enabled uh, by a number of factors, uh, including uh, the availability of credit. Uh, and finally, to say that none of that would happen without sufficient capacity of the society, uh, civil society, people like us, on the NGOs, business associations, uh, different kinds of entrepreneurs uh, coming together 
to really discuss what is happening that's good. And what we have learned the most in my country, and I'll finalize with that, is that the solutions were not elsewhere. The solutions were not uh, on how the Europeans were organized in the economy or how the Americans were organized in the economies. The solutions were actually in Brazil. Uh, and when we went to see in the communities what were the things that were actually, actually happening that allowed uh, income to be distributed, that allowed people to get out of poverty, we had a wealth of experiences. We had such a diverse number of local alternatives that were emerging from local entrepreneurs uh, and from local communities that were organized that it's just a question of us to be able to listen, to learn from them, to nurture them and to support them that account can be transformed. So that's a transformation we were part of uh, and I'm very glad that you gave me the opportunity to come tonight uh, and share that with you and to some extent be part of your transformation as well. Because no, no society be, uh, just stay quiet and stand still. All societies are on transformation, and I believe that, that uh, with your work and the great work that uh, Sam, Dr. Maponia, the university, uh, are, are providing with you as entrepreneurs to move from the understanding of entrepreneurship uh, in isolation, to understand that in conjunction with uh, fighting poverty and fighting injustice, we can produce a much, much brighter future. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. The University of Johannesburg. Rethink. Reinvent.